folks, and welcome to another db Sember. It's the holliest, jolliest, dragon balliest time of the year. Where we bombard you with our opinions. And just a little Christmas cheer. But this year, we're changing up the format. Again. Because who needs consistency? Besides pets and children and anyone looking for a stable relationship. In the past, we've had a top 24 every db Sember, But this year, we're chopping it down like a fresh Christmas pine. Clean down the middle, too. Instead of 24, like usual, it'll be a more song-accurate top 12. But don't worry too much. While we're listing fewer entries this year, we're doing something different with the honorable mentions to make up for it. A roundtable discussion where we cover all the entries that would have otherwise made up the bottom 12. Or however many didn't make it in general. Actually, uh, what are we talking about this year? Glad you asked, Kieran. This year, we're talking about our top 12 favorite fights in Dragon Ball. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, fuck that. What? I wouldn't touch that with a 50-foot North Pole. So God help ye, merry gentlemen, for I am out. Guy got us to put Battle of Z in the top 10 and this scares him? He's probably just bitter that we're not putting a single GT fight on the list. Also that, you elitist assholes! Oh shit. Kieran's peaced out, Tak is Canadian, and Moscow's too busy with his new What If series. Great. Sounds like if we want to make this db Sember work, we're going to need a Christmas miracle. Hey guys, what are you up to? <gasps> Granthony! Of course! William Grant Smith, aka Grant from TFS Gaming. He's so smart and handsome. Oh, well, that's me! Why is that me? We're trying to do this year's db Sember, but Kieran Space ducked out. We need someone who loves Dragon Ball and giving their opinions, but also has no problem stomaching the internet's bile. Well, gosh, guys, I'd love to help out. What's the list? Top 12 favorite fights in Dragon Ball. My Twitter mentions are going to be filled with fuck you, Grant, again, aren't they? It's the gift that keeps on giving. All right, but we're going to need some ground rules. First, we'll have multiple factors that go into scoring these entries. Presentation, because you know a fight has to look good. Choreography, because what's a fight if you don't get creative? And plot relevance, because what's the point of a fight if it's not important and nothing changes because of it? Second, these fights can include multiple characters as long as one side of the fight remains the same throughout. Once that side of the fight absconds, wins, or is defeated, the fight is over. Also, multiple characters can enter and leave the fight as long as it's only one side. However, like Piccolo versus Frieza, if a character switches out with the entire team, that will be considered a new fight. Third, fights can last multiple episodes slash chapters, but we will be scoring on how well these fights utilize their time given, aka pacing matters. And fourth, forms of characters do not count as separate characters. So for example, Fat Janemba is still Janemba. The determining factors on this might seem a little nebulous, and there are more factors that we didn't go over here. But sometimes lists like these can be more about what you feel in the heart than in the brain. Also, we are not the kings of Dragon Ball. This isn't a royal decree or anything. What about Dukes of Dragon Ball? Honestly, this is our opinion. And if you disagree, cool. Let us know in the comments. What do you think? What are your favorite fights? With that out of the way, let's get started with this year's db Sember. 12. Granthony. Kaiser. Did you mention Janemba because you knew this was coming first? Nah, it was good to get it out of the way immediately. I'm less concerned with that and more concerned with the fact that a movie fight made this list. Well, let me tell you, Lanny, you shouldn't be. While it's one of the only two movie entries on this list... Spoilers! Nobody cares. It's most certainly deserved of a spot on the list. Janemba might not have much of a personality, and his existence and development is disconcertingly similar to Boo, but his power set is creative, spectacularly demonstrated, and elevates this fight from just another movie fight to true greatness. I have to agree. Honestly, while it doesn't have any plot relevance to the series overall, the actual fight is gorgeous. Between the surrealist environment and Janemba's unique skill set utilized in a way rarely seen in Dragon Ball, Combined with some of the best art and animation the series has ever seen, god damn, man. For it to beat out canonical fights within the show, that's pretty tremendous, but I won't lie. Watching Janemba teleport and send attacks through portals, transform random items into deadly weapons, and hold off Goku and Vegeta without feeling like a curb stomp? You guys are right. This kind of deserves the spot. It's a ton of fun to watch Goku deal with. Between his overwhelming size, portal punching, and cloning, he forces Goku to transform into Super Saiyan 3 in one of the coolest looking transformations in the series. That scream lasts for an eternity. Shambles poor lungs. On the subject of animation, it's keen to point out that the films generally feature higher quality animation than the series. Generally. 
This is largely due to production timelines. While episodes generally have a shorter amount of time to be animated, the films regularly allow for more time with select animators to provide more polished cuts and tend to feature their most talented. Such as in this fight scene featuring Tadayoshi Yamamura, a veteran of the franchise. One of the most impressive features of this fight is its choreography. As the series progressed, it was becoming tough to feature traditional martial arts choreography and still emphasize the speed and power of characters known for being able to eradicate planets with their fingers. But with just the right mixture of grace and weight, you see a lot of spectacular and varied attacks while even utilizing the environment. Are those things jelly beans? I mean, they're made out of crystal or some shit, but what are they? I think we've mentioned it before, but if Janemba had an honest-to-god personality and been a part of the series proper, he'd possibly be one of the most creative and interesting villains in the franchise. At least if the series proper could match this... Have we said spectacular? Um, outstanding fight. Crap, we're through all our descriptors in the first part. Screw it, they know what we mean. TLDR, this fight looks bitchin' and it's a thrill to watch. It's just too bad that there's no emotional investment or relevance to the plot. Oh wait, hold on. Are we counting Gogeta? I mean, his scene is positively gorgeous, even though it's an instant win and over as quickly as it began. I mean, we'd have to count Fat Gogeta. You mean the joke they unabashedly repeated from the show? Yeah, okay, let's not. Oh, he'll get his due in the new super movie. Spoilers! Oh, to whom? Eleven. I'm afraid of how many Dragon Ball fans haven't watched the original Dragon Ball. Those people are free to buy the blue bricks and correct that mistake, then leave their angry comments disagreeing with us in that order. This is a controversial pick regardless. This fight certainly isn't one of the most well-animated. Or most dramatic. Or most action-packed. Or most plot-relevant. Kaiser, explain. Hey, look, you guys aren't wrong. But this fight is a big deal for a lot of reasons, the most important of which being its creativity. While fights later on this list might have more action, better animation, and involve higher stakes, this fight is the climax of the first, uh, well, uh, the 21st, Tenkaiji Budokai in which Son Goku squares off with Master Roshi, disguised as Jackie Chan. I remember watching this fight back in the day and finding myself laughing more than fist pumping, but admittedly, there's something truly compelling about this fight. And I think that goes beyond it just being the first time Goku challenges Roshi in a one-on-one. -on -one. It's more about the future of Goku as a fighter in the first place. Dragon Ball was a comedy adventure manga when it was initially published by Akira Toriyama back in 1984 and was only moderately successful as a successor to Dr. Slump, his prior hit manga series during its infancy. But when the series started to put a heavier focus on martial arts, Dragon Ball would start to grow into the powerhouse we know it today. The 21st Tenkaichi Budokai. Uh, okay, dude, just say World Martial Arts Tournament. The 21st number one under the heavens martial artist gathering was the first real implementation of this change in focus from Toriyama. While the training for Krillin and Goku had been the entire lead into this tournament, it was often played for laughs, though it did try to give logical and tangible reasoning to many of the struggles the young fighters would endure on their journey to the tournament. And after several grueling fights, some completely played for laughs while others surprisingly dramatic, it comes down to Goku versus Jackie Chun. And man, does this one stop the show. That doesn't sound as good as a showstopper, does it? It truly does pull out all the stops, though. Throughout the tournament, we see techniques aplenty, but it's here that Jackie Chun and Goku have to use everything in their repertoire to earn that W, while even inventing some new techniques along the way. And while many of them are played for laughs, that doesn't make the fight necessarily worse. In fact, it's one of the most entertaining and engaging in the series by virtue of just being so creative and surprising. Just when you think Goku's got the upper hand, Roshi pulls out the drunken fist. So what does Goku pull out? The spinning monkey. So how does Jackie Chun counter this? With his paralyzing technique. And when all seems lost for Goku, he transforms into a giant fucking monkey. It's fun to watch the fight utilize a Chekhov's gun like that, having already established the ability for Goku to transform in the past and bringing it back here to change the flow of the fight. And in keeping tradition, Toriyama's response to this? Blow up the moon. I love how we're just going to ignore the catastrophic nightmare that would occur from such a scenario, and that Master Roshi is stupid powerful to pull off such a thing. Kaiser, are you talking about feats? Oh, gee, no, never mind, let's just- Are people who are obsessed with that shit called feet fetishists? Moving on! It's after Roshi defeats the Great Ape, though, that we get to my favorite part of the fight, because this is where it becomes a drag-out brawl between the two of them beating the living snot out of each other as they have no key left for beams, blasts, or techniques. And it's a damn shame that the dub had to remove the score for the scene, 
as it was positively transcendent. I implore Dragon Ball fans who have only watched this scene dubbed to check it out sub. It uses an image song never licensed by Funimation and it sets the mood perfectly. And at the end of the fight proper, they're on their last legs, which is a fitting turn of phrase as Roshi realizes that while Goku might match him in strength, he does not match him in length. <laughs> as in his legs. Yep. Turns out Roshi realizes that his height advantage on Goku allows him to land a harder, more effective attack when the two come colliding, and is able to put his pupil down for the count. Which is a tremendously satisfying victory when you think about it. Because an important part of this fight that we haven't covered yet was the purpose of Roshi within it, and how it relates to Goku. See, Krillin and Goku are Roshi's greatest students, something the Turtle Hermit realizes almost as soon as he's taken them under his wing. And he also fears that, should their inherent talent and hard work pay off too spectacularly, they might find themselves at a peak with nowhere to go or, even worse, believe that they have achieved the peak of martial arts in general and quit altogether. Roshi doesn't want these kids to just succeed. He wants them to ascend to higher heights never imagined by those in their field. So Roshi's plan? Beat his pupils and let them know they still have greater heights to reach. Which, in terms of motivation, is remarkably human and ties deeply into the roots and philosophy of martial arts. The betterment of oneself and the pushing of not only your own boundaries, but the higher limits of those who came before you. It's not the most compelling, well-animated, or action-packed but it's easily one of the most creative, entertaining, and important fights in Goku's journey. And I hope those who haven't watched Dragon Ball at all give the series a chance. Its beginnings are humble, but remarkably charming, and it's still easily my favorite Dragon Ball series. Monster Carrot is dead. Dude! What? Roshi blew up the moon! He was up there making mochi! That dude's fucking dead! Then why the hell did Goku bring Frieza back for the Tournament of Power? Who needs Ultra Instinct when you can transform Jiren into a carrot? At least then he'd have more personality. hey -o! 10. This is a strange pick, but I think we all sort of knew it was going to be on the list. I don't think group fights like this happen enough in Dragon Ball, but when they do, they've always got so much going for them. And this one against the Ginyu Force's loudest and proudest member, Raccoon, definitely has its fair share. The Ginyu Force always felt like a double-edged sword to me. What a colorful and diverse group of villains with unique powers! Wouldn't it have been great to see them all throughout this arc? Won't lie, they're notably more compelling than Zarbon and Dodoria, though we still love Frieza's right and left hand men respectively. It's just too bad they show up out of nowhere, as if Toriyama realized he'd written himself into a corner by killing off all of Frieza's minions. Can't have the big bad himself step in just yet, so why don't we chuck these color-coded kooks at him? Of course, this does make for a couple spectacular fights. We'd be remiss not to mention Goldo's fight with Gohan and Krillin, what with its psychic shenanigans and time stoppery. Not to mention one of the most brutal endings to a fight in all of Dragon Ball. But the real meat of the battle comes when Raccoon steps up to the plate. He's a tower of power, and unlike with Nappa, he's less of a meathead and more of a professional wrestler, showing off and having the time of his life as he goes up against our woefully outclassed heroes. Vegeta comes out swinging in one of the most beautifully animated segments in the entirety of the series up to this point. He holds nothing back in his tenacious assault, and while Raccoon takes the damage, he doesn't really show any signs of slowing down, and his counterattack shows the power gap between them in brutal contrast. While Vegeta manages to put some dirt on him, he also finds himself with a foot in the grave before Raccoon's even broken a sweat, and it's only due to the efforts of Krillin and Gohan that he doesn't find himself on the receiving end of a killing blow. It's unfortunate that the back and forth ends here, though, because while Krillin manages to deal noticeable damage to Raccoon, it's merely cosmetic, and after that, it's a real curb stomp. Krillin goes down in a single shot, and Gohan, despite drumming up the courage and strength to fight, is brutalized and eliminated from the battle without much effort on Raccoon's part via a broken neck. Which is, in itself, a double-edged sword. This systematic takedown of our heroes ratchets up the drama and despair with remarkable effectiveness, as Raccoon proves just how out of depth our heroes are. But a curb stomp does not necessarily a good fight make. There's only so much you can get out of a battle when one side has no hope of pulling out a victory. Truly spectacular fights have a give and take, a back and forth, swaying to each side as they progress the battle and inch themselves closer to a possible victory. And ultimately, this fight just devolves into them stalling for time until Goku arrives, a trope that, at this point, had already been tired out and would continue to be used in this very arc. And while Raccoon's onslaught is impressive and effective, it's also hard to feel like it's all that compelling. This scenario in particular had been done better before, as we said, and, well, we'll talk about 
that later. But as for this fight, it's still uniquely memorable for its amazing animation, brutality, and for being one of the few group fights in the series. While they may not work much in unison, it's still a thrilling change of pace from Dragon Ball's usual matchups. Moreover, the tension between Vegeta and his shaky alliance with the Earthlings as they tag each other out makes everything feel like it's inches away from falling apart. It's bad enough our guys have to fight one of the baddest broods in the galaxy, but they can't even get along while doing it. The mental turmoil of our underdogs also comes in stark contrast to the heckling of Jason Berger, who provide both comedic relief with their zany wagers and bleak reminder that Raccoon is merely a part of this ruthless cheer squad. It's just too bad Goku's gotta show up and ruin the mood. Seriously, I would've loved more time with the Ginyu Force as a real threat. All this masterfully crafted tension is less than five Namekian minutes away from being thrown out the window. But at least we can enjoy it while it lasts. And it wouldn't be nearly as effective if it overstayed its welcome. On a related note... Nine. Can I just say I'm really glad Tien got to make the list somewhere? I'd be upset if you weren't, honestly. While our favorite Triclops gets mostly kicked to the curb in later chapters outside of the occasional Kiko hello, his first real showdown with Goku is a doozy. Before we get into the battle proper, though, it's important to know what's driving all three eyes at this point. Tin Shin Han has fought his way through Yamcha and Jackie Chun in the hopes of facing Mercenary Tao's killer and his rival martial arts school star pupil, Son Goku. This final round of the tournament is all that stands between Tin Shin Han and that sweet, sweet revenge. Well, that's his motivation initially. While upholding the Master's honor is still important, a big part of Tien's journey to the finals has been discovering that he isn't the ruthless killers his Masters want, and his real goal is to just be a great fighter and to test himself against stronger opponents. Okay, so maybe he isn't the first face turn in the series, but at this point, Tien is easily the most dramatic and fleshed out good guy conversion we've seen yet all leading to this final duel. Kicking off the fight in high gear, one of the first things we see is both fighters using very familiar techniques. While Tien's Dodon Ray and Goku's after images were decisive victories in previous rounds, this initial clash instantly tells the audience we're about to dial things up a bit. All the while boasting some stellar artwork and animation. While the fight definitely suffers from peaks and valleys in visual quality later on, the opening onslaught is a sight to behold. More like peaks and volleys as Tien sets up Goku with a healthy serving of the volleyball fist. Uh. Oh, so it's fine when you do it. Puns aside, the real tragedy of this fight is the fact that it's full of unique moves we'll never see Tien use again. Where was the volleyball technique when Nappa showed up? Not every move is so easily forgotten, though. In fact, this next one eventually gets picked up by most of the main cast. This isn't the first time we've seen the solar flare at this point, and much to Ten Shin Han's dismay, Goku sees right through the attack with style, courtesy of one befuddled turtle hermit and those classic sunglasses. The World Martial Arts Tournament Committee has a fairly cut and dry stance when it comes to outside interference and the use of tools. According to the rules, I'm pretty sure this is the part where Goku gets disqualified. If sunglasses break the rules, Chiaotzu's telepathy obliterates them. The real question here is how does it take Tien so long to figure out what's going on? The man has three eyes, but he fails to see Goku Goku clinching up out of nowhere? Although this eventually leads to some important character stuff and looking beautiful while doing it, this whole cheating fiasco does drag the fight out quite a bit. Other than Goku creatively using a Kamehameha to recover from a near ring out, this whole section is just a one-sided pummeling from Ten Shin Han. I don't know, I'm a pretty big fan of Tien's rapid velocity technique. Yeah, you know that thing you did as a kid where you spun your arms really, really fast to make an unblockable punch? Goku's friends even figure out what's going on from the sidelines and never bother telling the tournament staff. Luckily for them, Tien dials Chiaotzu with his brain phone and tells him to stop interfering. And after Roshi sends an irate Master Shen over the horizon, the match is back underway. Tien gives Goku a couple of free hits to make up for all the cheating he ignored, and tells him he's kinda over the turtle and crane drama and just wants to prove he's the best fighter for himself. And Chiaotzu seems pretty psyched about this development too. There's that extra narrative weight we were looking for. One of our earliest genuine bad guys turning good guy because Goku's just so darn great at fighting. So great, in fact, that Tien decides he needs two more arms just to keep up. From this point on, the whole fight is pretty intense. Enough dragging our feet with character building. Let's get back to punchies. With a hand for each limb, Tien grabs Goku and starts using his rib cage as a makeshift hat. It's a little bold, but I think he can pull it off. Fortunately, Goku has one furry limb in his pants that Ten Shin Han wasn't ready for. Kaiser? His tail. Oh. With some quick thinking monkey business, the pint sized Saiyan escapes Tenshinan's grasp and goes back on the offensive with some extra arms of his own. 
Vitruvian Goku gets in close to break through Tien's four-armed forearm defense, but not without taking some serious damage along the way. In the end, neither fighter is on their feet. The way they both fall to the ground in unison reminds me a lot of Goku versus Jackie Chun from a little bit ago, and I'm sure it's no accident. Absolutely. Luckily, both fighters are able to stand up before the announcer finishes the 10 count this time, but they're clearly nearing the ends of their respective ropes. That is, until Goku rushes in and locks Tien down with the... Walls of Jericho? Uh, Boston Crab, sir. Boston Crab, which is enough to get Tien to finally bid farewell to arms and go back to faring well with two arms. Okay, you're gonna have to stop doing that. This is what you get for inviting me. To top things off, we finally see the signature move everyone knows and loves, the dreaded tri-beam Kikoho! Rising into the air as Kikuchi's best O Fortuna impression swells, Tien gives Goku one final warning before sending the entire arena to hell with an earth-shattering blast! The crowd looks on in horror as the smoke clears. Little Goku. But wait, up in the sky! Turns out that warning really came in handy as Goku took Tien's advice and jumped really high to avoid the attack. With his last bit of real energy, he uses a Kamehameha to launch himself headfirst in Tien's ribs, sending both martial artists hurtling towards the streets below. It's here that we get one of the most memorable shots in all of Dragon Ball, as Goku and Shinhan plummet towards the ground, struggling for any inch that might stop them from landing first. Unfortunately for our young hero, a little bit of traffic went a long way to keep him from winning the fight. With all the rule bending in this fight, it seems sort of fitting that the most outside of interference is what decided this match. Tien ought to split the prize money to fix that van like it fixed the fight. And it's just that kind of thematic genius that lands Goku versus Tien in our top 10. <laughs> top 10. Bet you Launch wishes she could do that. Good night, everybody! Eight. Ah, the fight that launched a thousand Vegeta AMVs. It's almost hard to look at this fight without some crunchy butt rock echoing in my brain. Vegeta friend, punch him in the face, you're the great of fans. He will never lose to you, you stupid pack rock bitch. Yeah. It's pretty easy to see why. This fight has some breathtaking set pieces and phenomenal choreography. If only it were anything close to consistent. Luckily, Vegeta don't need to be so pretty to be so damn savage. The universe's grumpiest prince is in peak fighting condition thanks to some performance-enhancing wizard magic and seven years of training in the most intense conditions Capsule Corp could muster. With every bone-breaking blow, we see just how deep this Napoleon complex goes. If you like how he throws a punch, wait till you see him throw shade. I'm a man who loves his big dramatic monologues, but I've got to hand it to the Prince of All Saiyans on this one. That speech with Goku strapped to the side of a mountain is downright cathartic. Speaking of mountains, this fight might have some of the best use of scenery in all of Dragon Ball. We got smashing through mountains. We got sneaking in caves. We got attempted stage fatalities. We got friggin' boulder gauntlets. There's even a bonafide beam struggle! Up to this point, we've had Vegeta threatening to one day surpass Golden Boy Goku ever since the two crossed paths. As time went on and new threats appeared in the forms of Frieza, the androids, and the encroaching Majin Buu, Vegeta's obsessive rivalry has always been present, but never more than a snide remark or cranky scowl. Things were starting to look up once Goku announced his day off from death. A martial arts tournament would make an ideal stage for these two to settle the score. And what do you know? They're scheduled to fight in the first round. At last, the proud Saiyan Prince will have his day! Naturally, nothing goes as planned, and now His Highness is stuck putting his neck on the line for Earth again. And it's all because that clown Kakarot refuses to take him seriously. At this point, the gang isn't even sure Boo's gonna be that much of a threat after seeing Bobbity's other minions, so it's easy to see why this would be so frustrating for Vegeta. As if that weren't enough to chip away at the old pride, he also catches a glimpse of some of Goku's power during the fight with Hakone and realizes He's already outmatched. By now, Vegeta's ego has been demolished, and Goku's day on Earth has practically just started. So when Bobby swaggers onto the scene and dangles a chance to defeat his rival right in front of his face, well, Vegeta just can't help himself. With enchanted juice pumping through his veins and some new forehead decor, Jeets embraces his midlife crisis heel turn and blows up a city block to celebrate. Goku is understandably not entirely thrilled about that, so he agrees to give Baby his bottle and fight him. 
Whoa now, Lanny. When you put it that way, it almost sounds like you don't think Goku took this fight all that seriously. I mean, are we going to address the long-haired, eyebrow-lacking elephant in the room? Knowing Goku's pack in Super Saiyan 3 in retrospect diminishes a lot of the tension in this fight. We know this isn't Goku at his full strength, and it just reinforces the fact that this rivalry still hasn't had a truly all-out round 2. You could argue that Goku assumed the transformation would eat up the rest of his time on Earth so he avoided it, but it's still kind of an insult to Vegeta that he never found it necessary. Look, if hiding a transformation that might consume too much energy to even be worth using is a dick move, I don't even know how to classify incinerating a crowd of onlookers because you realized you like having a wife and son. Regardless, this is still an excellent fight and a fantastic example of character-driven conflict. While Vegeta loves to tell us all about how much Goku's very existence tortures him, this fight shows us what that means. It gives us a much more nuanced motivation than Dragon Ball's typical win the tournament or save the universe. This fight is personal, and that makes a huge difference, even if we later learn that Goku isn't giving it his all. And again, it can't be overstated how great some of this choreography is. The last bit of close quarters combat before Majin Buu is revived is some top-notch fisticuffs and among the highest bars the series ever hits. What this fight may lose in stakes and a proper ending, it more than makes up for with moments like that. It's really unfortunate that Boo wakes up before this fight gets a satisfying conclusion, but since it ultimately leads to one of the most iconic moments in the character's history, I think it's fair we let it slide this time. Plus, that surprise neck chop lets Vegeta technically win this round, which means we gotta get that tiebreaker sooner or later, right? Goku's never actually beaten Vegeta one on one, has he? That first round was kind of a group effort. Oh man, that means this sleazy knockout is the only real conclusion to a one-on-one -on -one fight these two have ever had. Whatever you gotta tell yourself, guys. Ha <laughs> ha! Victory for Vegeta! Seven. Okay guys, I don't want to alarm you, but I think we might have a fight on this list that doesn't involve Son Goku in any way, shape, or form. What? But this is Dragon Ball! Surely if he isn't the one throwing the punches, he must be on his way. Piccolo's just holding off the bad guys till he gets here. Yeah, no, he's at the lookout and apparently has no intention of getting involved. You heard it here, folks. This part of the countdown just became a no-Goku zone. With Cell busy with his Suck Everything Dry tour and all the Earthbound Saiyans focused on working out, the recently commie-infused Piccolo has taken it upon himself to shut down the Robo Twins and their red-headed stepbrother. Yeah, I guess their shoplifting and van-stealing antics have gone a little too far. Guess the former Guardian has to step in and put these rowdy teenagers in a well-deserved timeout. They literally showed up at Kame House looking for a fight. Even if it was clear by this point that the numbered androids weren't the main threat, they're still very capable of apocalyptic levels of destruction. On top of that, there's a seven-foot-tall bugman looking to consume them. It, it's probably for the best that the group just get these pieces off the table while they can. Fair point. We see Piccolo beefing himself up for the fight, and right away we see some heavy hits from our resident Super Namekian. The previously untouchable Android 17 finds himself on the receiving end of some earth-shattering blows and realizes he might actually need to try this time. After a couple deflected blasts, we get to see what might be my favorite move in the entire show, and the part most people remember from this fight. The Hell Zone Grenade! The light shifts and drenches the scene in yellow and purple as Piccolo launches a flurry of blasts towards the snarky teen. After a quick moment of terrified realization, the blasts converge on Android 17 and erupt in a huge explosion! Even if it's ultimately fruitless, it's still such a cool technique that we sadly never really get to see again. Our raven-haired antagonist avoids defeat thanks to his signature energy barrier and continues the fight with an onslaught of high-speed punches and kicks. Even if the art in this segment isn't the most consistent, I love how frenetic and over-the-top it gets. The cartoonishly emphasized punches stretching through their target's backs, volcanoes erupting, and the whole island being demolished as the battle rages on gives you a really good sense of just how powerful these guys are. All the while, we catch glimpses of Cell getting closer and closer to the battlefield, while the fight loudly revels in how insane it can get most of the cutaways are dedicated to showing the real monster cryptically approaching. Eschewing more flashy techniques, the battle becomes a knockdown, drag out brawl between Green Man and Boybot, and it's one of the most satisfying and brutal exchanges of blows we see in the entire franchise. Despite how short this fight actually is, the last desperate struggle truly emphasizes how worn down both sides have become, which makes the next reveal all 
the more dreadful. As it turns out, Piccolo's enormous power level acted like a beacon for Cell, who just finished chowing down in a city full of people and is looking at his siblings for a dessert. Guess we'll have to call this fight a draw because this big cockroach doesn't plan on waiting. It's a shame that this is one of Piccolo's last real fights in DBZ, but it's a strong one to go out on. It might be somewhat short and really doesn't have that big of an impact on the story, but just about every second of it is exciting and has something fun to offer. It's also unfortunate that 17 doesn't really get much of a chance to show off his moves before or after this battle until super, but he's honestly kind of like he got one at all considering how quickly Cell gets involved. Uh, excuse me, Kaiser, but aren't we forgetting about GT and Super 17? Oh, Cranthony, no amount of alcohol has helped me do so yet. Honestly, they're just not good fights. Do you think Super 17 could beat up 17 from Super? Oh, hold on, so you're saying Super 17 doesn't make this list at all? What's next? You'll tell me there aren't any GT fights on this list? I, yeah, who knows? I, I, this is just number seven. I mean, just give it a couple more entries. I'm sure uh, we're saving the best for last. Oh my God, there aren't any GT fights on this list. Six. Okay, now this one, this one's probably gonna be a little controversial. I mean, despite being one of the last high stake conflicts in all of Z, Cuckoo's fight with Kid Buu usually doesn't come up when people talk about their favorite fights. After reviewing the footage, it's hard to see why. Kid Buu's insanity is masterfully animated and boasts some of the most unique choreography in the whole series, and Goku's superhuman acrobatics are a joy to behold. Hell, most of the cutaways during the battle are dedicated to showing everyone else in Otherworld losing their shit at just how crazy it all is. The issue is it's easy to lose this gym in the series of fights that surround it. By this point in the saga, Buu's been here for a while, and since we're specifically talking Goku's throwdown with Kid Buu, it kinda ends with a fizzle. But everything between those two points is absolutely incredible. With the pudgy pink man-child of yore now reverted to his purest state, Kid Buu presents a truly chaotic threat, unlike most of the series' big baddies. While other climactic battles involve long-witted speeches about galactic conquest or the value of strength, this is a clash with the embodiment of extinction, a relentless nightmare blissfully ignorant of concepts like good or evil. Despite knowing another round of fusion would almost surely make quick work of the tiny pink menace, the good guys opt to play a rousing game of rock, paper, scissors to decide who seals the fate of the universe. After nearly an entire arc of magical power boosts and combining forces, it's nice to see a return to classic Dragon Ball form with individual martial artists choosing to fight the ultimate opponent with their own hard-earned strength. I also love how Kid Buu starts this fight sleeping, and frequently leaves himself wide open by pounding his chest for a bit. Goku hasn't fully powered up yet, and this little psycho knows there isn't much to worry about at this point. We're treated to some gorgeous choreography as these two titans of combat reshape the planet in their warm-up. Mountains crumble and the sky changes colors as Buu's power begins to erupt, and Goku responds by adding some volume to his hair and really furrowing his brow. We'd only caught a glimpse of Goku's newly attained Super Saiyan 3 form earlier in the show against Fat Buu, and there was no way such an absurd transformation wasn't going to make a big comeback in the final act. With his life restored and a whole planet to use as a battlefield, it's time to see the main character finally go all out against the not so big but very bad Majin Buu. There's a lot of quick up close combat, but despite all the high speed action presented on screen, there's shockingly little repeated footage. Each interaction has a purpose and reaction, all animated with great detail and framing. Our combatant styles and personal personalities are also consistently showcased, with Goku's precision and focus being constantly battled away by Buu's sheer power and unpredictability. The scene where they fly across the horizon, shooting close range blasts at each other, making a line of explosions in the sky, is one of the most breathtaking set pieces in the whole series, and the animation is beautiful from beginning to end. This battle also takes full advantage of Buu's regenerative and shape-shifting abilities, which ratchets up the dismemberment quota by a wide margin. Nearly every earth-shaking blow from Goku leaves Buu disfigured and mangled but it never overstays its welcome. Boo's super stretchy limbs also give us a ton of unorthodox attacks as Boo stomps his way through the ground and strangle tosses Goku with his, what is that on his head? A horn? I believe the scientific term you're looking for is head tentacle. The resilience of the little pink imp is another major factor in this bout. While Boo is the clear winner of this fight by the end, it's not presented as a beatdown. Unlike most of the series' more one-sided fights, Goku vs. Kid Boo shows that both of our key players have similar power ceilings. Boo just has seemingly endless endurance and the ability to regenerate on his side, which is what nets him the win in the end. 
You see, Goku knew that Super Saiyan 3 was a huge burden on his energy and body, so he purposely avoided pushing himself to that point as long as he could, but Boo's ferocity proved too much for his other forms to handle. When backed into a corner and forced to release his full power, he quickly loses steam and reverts to his natural self, essentially ending this fight. We pretty much jump right into Vegeta trying to hold off Boo at this point. Is there a reason we don't treat this as a group fight? Not to say there isn't plenty to love in the rest of the group's struggle against Kid Boo. Between Vegeta's rousing speech, Mr. Satan's showboating, and the return of the fat Boo, we have some quality moments here, but it's significantly less consistent and striking than the first fight between the Little Demon and Goku. For quality and consistency sake, this is where we're ending the fight. Goku bounces back for a bit after Vegeta buys him some time, but it's short-lived. The rest of this conflict is spent going back to the old faithful strategy of letting everyone else get their asses kicked to buy some time for a spirit bomb. It's probably for the best that we limit this to the initial brawl between Goku and Boo because, again, it's a joy to watch. If we were grading purely on visual impact, I honestly think this fight would be the top of the list. But with everything else in mind, this seems like a good spot. It could have been longer and had a more satisfying resolution, but in the end, it stands as a brief, yet brilliant, bit of brutality. Five. Bust out the popcorn, boys. DB Simber's going back to the movies. While Super Sweet Telling of Goku's fracas with the Divine has some interesting additions, we opted to go with the original, more streamlined version from the film. Returning DB Simber fans will remember just how much of an impact this movie had on us in 2015's Countdown, and this scuffle is a major highlight. This fight also serves as a great introduction to Beerus and his relationship with Goku. Despite having a very brief encounter earlier on King Kai's planet, it's in this second fight that we really see how these two interact once they find themselves on equal footing. It's been four years since Majin Buu had the universe on the brink of annihilation, and our heroes find themselves in a time of peace and prosperity. Bulma's gathered the Dragon Balls and is ready to throw the biggest birthday party this world has ever seen. That is, until some uninvited guests show up looking for a certain Super Saiyan God. After a quick chat with an unusually nervous Shenron, Goku finds out that the secret to godhood is the friends and babies we made along the way. With a new red-hot look and the strength of the divine flowing through him, everybody's favorite saying is ready to give Beerus the fight he's been waiting for. The dynamic camera angles and high-flying action whizzing through the cities looks amazing. I'm usually not a fan of the newer animation style more recent Dragon Ball products employ, but other than a few awkward shots, the visuals in this fight are stunning. The scenery is almost constantly shifting, giving us tons of eye candy and giving viewers a great sense of scale. From busy city streets to placid underground lakes, this fight literally goes places and lets the audience feel the speed of the fight as each clash takes them to new locales. The character work here is on point as well. Throughout the whole struggle, Goku and Beerus discuss the value of strength and what it means to be able to reach such dizzying heights on your own versus with the help of others. Goku's regret when he realizes his newfound power will never truly be his own, and Beerus's fascination with the Saiyan's obsessive attitude towards strength are terrific peaks into their psyche and add weight to the fight beyond the fate of the planet. It kind of says something when the destruction of all life on Earth isn't enough of a dramatic weight for a fight, but I guess that's a pretty common threat for these guys. And plus, just look at this face. This doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Beerus and why you should love him. I don't know what will. Then the unthinkable happens. Amid the scuffle, Goku's godhood disappears. Surely reverting to his natural Saiyan self will spell a quick end for this battle and the world as we know it. That's where you're wrong, Lanny boy. It's when Goku returns to fighting with his own strength that this battle truly hits its climax. The movie's theme song blares as our now golden-haired hero erupts from the caves below and we're treated to a dizzying sky dance of fists and fury. Seeing Goku and Beerus rip through the clouds as the audience's perspective just barely manages to keep up for the first time was incredible to watch in a theater. It had been years since we had seen a new Dragon Ball fight of this magnitude, and the sense of speed and scale on display was just what the doctor ordered. Space is the final frontier for this clash of titans, and it's loaded with eye candy. The glow of the earth behind the combatants looks beautiful and gives us a constant visual reminder of what's at stake in this fight. As Beerus hurdles a miniature sun towards our humble blue planet, Goku releases as much energy as he can muster to protect his home, his god form flickering back to life momentarily. The blast is deflected, but the heroic Saiyan's body is spent. The fight is over. I like how Beerus demands that Goku specifically say he gives up. Rather than being some dominating villain, this is clearly a student-master relationship forming, mirroring Roshi's desire from earlier in the list to show Goku he still has a lot to learn. Shoutouts to recurring themes. 
Goku's fight with Beerus serves as a great lead into Super, adding two more lovable characters to our familiar cast and easing them in nicely. It also serves as our introduction to the concept of multiple universes and fills in some details on the spiritual hierarchy which will come into play later on. And it's just fun to watch from start to finish. Even with the world hanging in the balance, this fight never takes itself too seriously and knows how to throw in the comedy from time to time. And with that cat out of the bag, it lands feet first in our top five. You're really stretching for these closing lines, aren't you? Do your jokes have nine lines? Because they keep dying, Grant. <laughs> Me ouch. Am I right, guys? Uh, hey. Guys? Four. At this point, I wish to remind everyone in our audience that this list is purely an opinion. You might not necessarily agree with everything on this list. I might not necessarily agree with everything on this list. <laughs> You're right, Kaiser. This should have been higher. Do not test me, Granthony. This fight struck an interesting balance between us because it has a lot of factors going for it and against it. On one hand, we have Perfect Cell, one of the most charismatic and fun villains in the entire series, putting on a spectacular display of his extensive special move list against the star player for the good guys. On the other, we have a fight that has an unsatisfying conclusion, inconsistent visual quality, and serves as little more than a red herring for the real climactic showdown in this arc. Can you tell that I love playing up the antagonist in these? I feel like this fight is significantly more than the sum of its parts. And to address the nearby battle I have a feeling most fans were expecting here, Goku vs. Cell is a prelude to a fantastic moment. My absolute favorite event in the entire franchise, if I'm being honest. But it's not particularly a great fight. Once Gohan comes in, it's basically a cathartic beatdown and a beam struggle. It's fun, but not top 12 fight material. Our struggle begins shortly after our beloved champ, Mr. Satan, is caught off guard and cheated out of an easy victory victory against the biomechanical bully. Up first from the usual roster of our heroes is Goku, a man who has already admitted he thinks Cell is the stronger warrior. The first bit of this fight has some excellent choreography, as Cell and Goku get up close and personal with some high-speed fisticuffs that leave the onlookers stunned. Some of the animation is <laughs> a little rough from time to time, but when it looks good, it looks damn good. Gohan going Super Saiyan 2 for the first time is my favorite event in the series, but Goku and Cell blinking in and out of visibility as they zoom across the ring is definitely my favorite shot. Shoutouts to Cell's weird finger moves before he powers up as a close second, though. It's an exceedingly cool set piece to be sure, but I think you're forgetting just how rough the art can get in some of these spots. Uh, Goku and Cell are hilariously drawn in a handful of sequences, especially once the evil android starts multiplying. Even if the presentation isn't always the best, seeing Cell bust out the multi-form technique, special beam cannon, and Frieza's homing discs is a fun highlight reel of fights past. It's like telling the audience, hey, look how far we've come while still being the zany crazy move fest we've always been. If only they did more with it. With all the techniques at Cell's disposal, he had so much potential for a crazy move exhibition and we only get a handful. Do you think Cell can stretch his limbs or become giant like Piccolo? I always wondered if Cell would become a giant bug ape thing in a full moon. Oh god, what if he did both at the same time? Ew. Ew. After the stroll down memory lane and a narrowly avoided Kamehameha, the art and animation pick up spectacularly. I love this whole fight to death, but if I'm being honest, this is the part I'm usually thinking about. The choreography, shot composition, and frenetic sweeping angles make every move feel like this blindingly fast conflict. I don't think DBZ ever really quite sells the absurd speed these fighters regularly employ this well again. Yeah, this part, yeah, this, this looks amazing, okay? If the whole fight looked this good, we'd be having a very different conversation. We get some more dizzying speed punches before Cell realizes how disappointing it would be if Goku were to fall out of the ring. In one fickle sweep, he undoes the only real rule of the Cell games and destroys the arena. I'm not sure if he used Tenshinhar or Piccolo Cells on that maneuver. Fortunately, Goku doesn't seem to mind, and the fight continues, now with a much larger landscape to zip around and destroy. Again, all while looking gorgeous. After some more insanely fast martial arts, Goku is pushed into a corner and starts charging one of his biggest Kamehamehas yet. And oh no, he's aiming right at the earth. 
Luckily, there's a little yard rat trick Cell wasn't expecting, the instant transmission technique. Goku blinks into existence right in front of him and unleashes the iconic blast right in the smug bug's face. We've seen Cell take some serious damage before, but this is the first time he, uh, <clears throat> loses his head over it. Even though it's pretty clear that Cell will regenerate and be back in seconds, this hit is brutal. Once the dust settles and Cell's back on his feet, the two get back to the fight, albeit somewhat briefly. That big blast took a lot out of Goku and it's clear by this point he's struggling just to keep up. In a desperate attempt to put Cell down, Goku unleashes a huge flurry of blasts, but Cell's barrier keeps him from doing any real harm. With all his energy spent, Goku admits defeat and forfeits the match, much to Cell and everyone else's dismay. I mean, it's not like it never happens, but it's nice to see the character often treated like a free win button fight a big bad in the last hour and lose. Even if the fight fizzles out in the end, this is a pretty unique result. I might be in the minority here, but when I saw this for the first time, I was completely caught off guard. Goku stepping down to give Gohan a shot in the limelight was a powerful moment for me, and worked as a perfect capper for a fight that basically served as a highlight reel of Goku's life. I fully admit that at times this isn't the prettiest fight, and Gohan's transformation is a lot more emotionally resonant. But as a whole, Goku vs. Cell just has so much to offer, and I really think people just overlook it due to its proximity to a lot of people's favorite moment. I'm still not entirely sold, but you make a fair argument. This is a list of our personal favorite fights, and if it had that much of an impact on you and is this good to begin with, it definitely merits a spot on the countdown. Aw, you see, Kaiser? Isn't it nice to get along? Nice try, Nick, but Goku vs. Hit Round 2 ain't making the list. Aw, come on! 3. Haha, <laughs> here we are! Dragon Ball Super's glorious final bout. God damn it, you know that joke would have worked if this were a GT fight! <laughs> we were all three fairly critical of Super during its run, but not even we could deny that this battle was an outright masterpiece and an excellent entry to kick off our top three. Whether it's the visuals, the choreography, the interplay between characters, or the fact that this fight technically boasts the highest stakes in the whole series, this brief yet brilliant slugfest has it all, and is sure to be a touchstone for Dragon Ball fans for years to come. Of the table, I feel like I was the most vocal critic of Super, but this spectacular onslaught stirred even my cold GT-loving heart. Even if I feel like a majority of this tournament could have been drastically trimmed down, the finale made it all worth it. Jiren, the metaphorical wall with a personality to match, has proven too sturdy for even Goku's Super Saiyan Blue transformation and stands to finally win the entire tournament of power. With Vegeta knocked out of bounds, it looks like Universe 7 is down to their last fighter. Goku's Ultra Instinct is slowly coming together, but not quite fast enough to really put the hammer to the emotionless bruiser. Until now. It was a long, long buildup, but after a metric fuck ton of foreshadowing, Goku finally unleashes the full fury of Ultra Instinct. And it is a doozy. This fight revels in the you blink it, you miss it action moments, as Goku makes small, precise movements with huge explosions of multiple hits. After an entire arc of Jiren seeming nearly indestructible, it's really cathartic to see him finally take some damage. The animation and choreography take a huge leap forward in quality once the Ultra Instinct transformation is complete. Every punch is lovingly crafted to be satisfying to watch, and it just makes this whole fight rather striking. Oof. Jiren turns up the heat, losing his shirt in the process. You know, the universal sign that a Dragon Ball character is actually trying. And as the two bounce back and forth throughout the arena, Jiren's calm and focused demeanor continues to deteriorate as Goku's newfound power pushes him to new heights after some absolutely gorgeous choreography and a cool retrospective on Goku's history. It's clear that Jiren has reached his limit. And then Ultra Instinct just turns off. Turns out Goku was fighting way over his own head, and the whole time his body just couldn't keep up. With his opponent reduced to a crumpled mess on the ground, Jiren admits he doesn't like how things turned out, but he can't sacrifice the whole universe on such feelings. With a bit of a heavy heart, he tells Goku he'll never forget his unbreakable spirit and sends him flying. As Goku tumbles out of the arena, some unexpected allies appear. Frieza rescues the defenseless Saiyan mid-descent, and Android 17 reveals that he's been hiding in the rubble below as well. With their star player out of commission, the unlikely duo dash into the fray. Caught off guard and weary from his fight with Goku, Jiren is brought to his knees by the tenacious pair. Just when he's about to admit defeat, the desperate shouts of support from Topo awaken a new power within him! While a reinvigorated Jiren rises to face his assailants, Goku joins his weathered comrades, promising that working together is the only way they're gonna survive this fight. 
I adore Goku and Frieza's conversation here. It's rare to see these two speak so frankly with one another. Knowing that this is their last chance for survival, Frieza's kinda let himself be vulnerable for a second and demands Goku's word that he'll uphold his promise to revive him after the tournament. He's clearly terrified and knows that this is his only option. Goku's nonchalant but resolute assurance is also the pitch-perfect response to both infuriate and encourage the corner tyrant. The lighthearted teasing by Seventeen is also just adorable. With their barrier shattered and theme music blasting, Frieza and Goku charge headlong into their opponent. Vegeta's face when he sees the two people he hates most working together to save his life is priceless. As the pair keep Jiren occupied up close, Seventeen starts laying down some suppressive fire from a distance, forcing their mighty foe to retreat. Making excellent use of the crumbling arena, the fight goes vertical and starts moving up the center pillar, with Frieza and Goku bouncing off the rubble just to keep up. It looks amazing, and while incredibly quick, it's super easy to follow. It, it's tough to go beyond play-by-play -play on this fight because everything happens so fast and beautifully. Every clean hit has tons of weight, and the timing with the music is just flawless. It's a knockdown, drag out fight if there ever was one, and both sides sell their desperation with every attack. Have, have I mentioned yet that it just looks fucking gorgeous the whole time? Goku and Frieza's fastball special is another incredible moment in Dragon Ball history. What do you do if we can't fly over there or run fast enough to catch up? Throw me, damn it! I gotta jump the distance and have to catch me! It's so good! Also, it's kind of hilarious how Frieza just tackles him off the stage, only to land on some rubble and get absolutely pummeled by Jiren. I think he even rips off the end of Frieza's tail at this point. With the last of his strength and the sickest guitar lick backing him up, Goku launches himself at Jiren, pulsing with Super Saiyan energy. With one final push, Goku and Frieza take Jiren out of the ring and into the void below, ending the Tournament of Power once and for all as they collapse into the audience. I love seeing Goku's hair flickering with gold in the last attack. He can't even muster the strength that goes Super Saiyan, and yet he still goes head first into the fight. Also, Seventeen being the final survivor is a great touch. I doubt many people predicted he'd be the last man standing. All in all, it's an excellent fight. With top-notch animation, sound design, and pacing, the real shame is that it's so short and preceded by a lengthy less than stellar tournament. Hot damn, this entry's so good and we still have two more? Christmas came early, my friends. And so did I when I was watching this fight. Oh, dude. Oh, it's gross, you even for me. <laughs> two. Okay, I'm gonna repeat this one more time for all y'all in the back. If you still haven't watched the original Dragon Ball, you are missing out. The penultimate entry in our catalog of clashes is a stocking stuffed to the brim with everything we love in a good Dragon Ball fight. To most fans, Piccolo is a stoic mentor type that tries to keep a tent on the usual Super Saiyan circus, but this is back when he was most assuredly the baddest guy around. Hellbent on vengeance, our number one Namekian is here to annihilate Goku, and he demands an audience. We never get to see Piccolo quite this theatrically evil and over the top again, and that's really too bad. He's in rare form here, and it's unfortunate he doesn't keep up his dramatic flair after his face turn later on in life. He's kind of mesmerizing in these episodes. I guess age really matured him. It's worth noting our villain's only a few years old here. After a grueling tournament full of intense matches, it's time for the finals. Piccolo Jr., under the guise of Ma Jr., has torn his way through many of Goku's friends, including God himself, to make it to this prestigious stage, and his devilish ambitions show no sign of slowing down. Well, that's not entirely true. If there's one thing you could complain about with this top-notch tussle, is that it really likes to stretch those slow moments. It never becomes unbearable, but even the best Christmas trees could use a little trimming. They probably just want to give you a chance to catch your breath from this spectacular choreography. By now, our heroes are obviously way beyond any realistic human limitations, but this is one of the last fights that primarily focuses on the thoughtful martial arts. Goku uses inventive grapples and some fancy footwork while dealing with Piccolo's elastic limbs, and the action is never difficult to follow. On top of all this prodigious pugilism, we've also got Kami to worry about. Piccolo's better half is literally trapped in the belly of the beast, and too much force from Goku might spell the end for the Earth's Guardian. Not to mention the tournament crowd more or less acts like one giant hostage for Piccolo to threaten whenever things stop going his way. Other villains might be capable of bigger explosions or doing more widespread damage, but it's not often we see regular people caught in the crossfire with these fights. Luckily, the audience eventually realizes the danger they're in and scatters, but only after seeing Piccolo's antennae of all things. I guess the green skin, pointy ears, and pink muscles weren't enough of a hint that this guy might have been related to King Piccolo. Things go from bad to big as Junior makes like the Grinch's heart and jumps up several sizes. And what's worse, 
He's just as quick as ever. Not as quick as Goku's thinking, though. A big body means a big mouth, and a big mouth means a big opening. You don't mean... Yep. Goku goes on a fantastic voyage through the less than jolly green giant's innards until he finds Kami's prison capsule and sets him free. Realizing this huge size is just asking for another internal invasion, Piccolo reverts to his normal size and continues the fight. It's a cool way to subdue a giant enemy, and it works really well within the zaniness of the series. Goku and Piccolo ferociously battling in the sky above the arena is one of the most stunning pieces of animation in the series. Each bone-crushing impact flows through their entire body, and the level of tiny details in each shot is astounding. Remember those fancy feet from earlier? What if I told you they could shoot energy beams? Just when things start getting out of hand, Goku's toes do the talking with a special foot-based Kamehameha. Roshi mentions how this is great for keeping your hands free for doing more punching, and I'm left wondering why no one utilizes this pro strat ever again later in the series. I don't know, Roshi makes it sound pretty difficult, and I think once everyone can fly, their hands are free for punching anyway. If anything, it might just stop him from kicking. Using some quick thinking and nimble dodging, Goku manages to send one of Junior's attacks right back at him, forcing the ruthless fighter to reveal his ability to regenerate limbs. I know it's a staple of Piccolo's arsenal now, but this was the first time we'd ever seen this ability, and boy was it shocking. Especially since they uh, hadn't changed his blood to purple yet. Oh. After some city-leveling explosions and one hell of a Kamehameha, Piccolo appears to finally be defeated as the announcer begins his count. Goku turns to wave at his friends, leaving himself wide open for a Namekian mouth laser straight through the shoulder. This is when we get to see Piccolo be more brutal than most of the guys on this list. The stuff he does to Goku while he's barely clinging to life is bone-chilling. Things start getting so dark, Kami begs Tien to kill him just to get rid of him. In the end, Goku's pulverized body musters just enough strength to avoid his opponent's final attack and land a devastating headbutt. Unable to continue fighting, the seemingly unstoppable Piccolo Jr. finally collapses and Goku is crowned champion of the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai, or World Martial Arts Tournament, there you go. The combatants might not be all that strong in the grand scheme of Dragon Ball, but with so many twists and good old-fashioned martial arts, this fight is undoubtedly a highlight of the entire series and a must-watch for fans of any era. Number 1 Towering above all other fights like a great ape, behold the absolute peak of Dragon Ball Throwdowns! Prince Vegeta's debut battle has so much going on and works together so seamlessly that this was among one of the easiest decisions we had to make. Vegeta immediately struts his terrifying stuff by reducing his former comrade Nappa to dust without even breaking a sweat. Considering the big bruiser had already shown himself to be a monster in his own right, it's instantly clear that this new baddie is going to be brutal. I love how almost every shot frames Vegeta as just looming over Goku while they speak, giving the audience a clear visual indicator that this guy stands above every threat the Earth has ever faced, and he knows it. Little details like this scattered throughout the fight go a long way in establishing a major theme. Everybody else on this backwater planet is below this man. Despite all the odds being stacked against him, Goku assumes his classic stance, commenting that even though he knows Vegeta is more than capable of killing him, he's excited to have a chance to test himself against such a fierce opponent. Before the fight even starts, we see the conflict these characters will share for the rest of the series. Goku's steadfast desire to be challenged runs in direct opposition to Vegeta's ruthless ambition to be the best, and neither side has the will to back down. The emotional whiplash of Goku going from seemingly untouchable during his fight with Nappa to barely keeping up with Vegeta is striking. Even the Kaioken, a technique so powerful Goku runs the risk of destroying his body just by using it, is easily dismissed by the arrogant prince. The only way he'll even stand a chance is by pushing his body and energy to their limits and busting out the Kaioken multipliers, further jeopardizing not only his ability to fight, but his very life. As Goku starts to close the gap in strength with his dangerous power boosts, Vegeta's confident demeanor begins to waver. Much to the cocky warrior's dismay, this low-class peasant manages to land some spectacular-looking hits, shattering his expectations of an easy conquest. Despite still having a clear upper hand, the thought of even being slightly tested by such a fighter sends the prince's ego spiraling. At this point, Vegeta resolves to just vaporize the Earth and be done with this shit, resulting in Dragon Ball's first beam struggle. It's easily one of the most iconic moments in all of Dragon Ball, and it just looks amazing. The contrasting colors and lighting effects sell this clash. I, I just... 
wow. I started watching Dragon Ball around this time, and I remember the dueling energy beams from Goku and Vegeta was the moment I knew I was watching something special. Having been bested by a juiced-up Kamehameha, Vegeta decides it's time to put these measly Earthlings in their place and transforms into a giant ape. It's a blow to his pride, but he ultimately decides it's better to utterly crush this stubborn upstart before he gets any crazy notions of hope. This is Goku's first time seeing the Ozaru transformation for himself, reminding him of Grandpa Gohan's fate. It's a cryptic connection, and goes a long way to illustrate how Saiyans tend to leave nothing but destruction and death in their wake. I know he doesn't really have time to dwell on it, but Goku gets over the fact that he killed Grandpa Gohan pretty quickly. I guess he's had quite a few years to mourn, but it's still a pretty devastating thing to just find out. While narrowly avoiding the colossal primate's attacks, Goku begins looking for time to charge the ace up his sleeve, the Spirit Bomb. Unfortunately, one clumsy step from the gargantuan gorilla is enough to shatter Goku's legs, making the already Herculean task of gathering energy nearly impossible. He lands a nice shot on one of Vegeta's huge eyes, though. I was honestly surprised Vegeta didn't spend the rest of this series with an eye patch or something. A permanent scar would have been a great constant reminder of his defeat and would have served as a hell of a motivator. With Goku's body, absolutely ravaged by his massive opponent, it's time for reinforcements! Gohan and Krillin attempt to stride the enormous beast long enough to cut off his tail, but their efforts, much like their stature, come up short. That is, until the unsung hero of Dragon Ball finally shows himself and saves the day! Wielding his katana with the ease of a well-seasoned master, Yajirobe slices off the burly beast's tail, reverting him back to the pint-sized Vegeta we all know and fear. Vegeta is downright savage here. After brutalizing a five-year-old, he lodges a flying knee into the prone Goku's chest cavity. Gohan tries his best to fend off his father's assailant, but it's Krillin's throwing arm that eventually turns the tide. The first and only use of a spirit bomb that isn't the size of a miniature planet, and it was tossed by Krillin of all people. Moments like that and Gohan standing up to Vegeta and Yajirobe's brief flirtations with courage really set this fight apart for me. I feel like everyone involved has a meaningful contribution, and considering how rare group fights already are in the series, Group fights where everyone contributes is, well, this is kind of the only one I can think of. Any normal fight would have probably ended here, but Vegeta's onslaught ain't over yet. Bruised and battered in both body and ego, the vicious prince rises yet again, and Goku's fresh out of spirit bombs. Too bad that fake moon is still kicking around because Gohan just conveniently grew back his tail. I always just assumed he was hiding it in his pants. I'm sure he knows it's unusual, so why show it off? Either way, the toddler turned titan is more than enough to finally subdue the royal pain. Gohan becoming a giant ape is such a good resolution for this fight. Not only does it allow Vegeta's hubris to play into his final downfall, it reframes the transformation as Earth's savior instead of its destroyer. It subverts everything about Vegeta and his image of Saiyans in one foul swoop. The shot of his broken body collapsed beneath a sleeping child is about as far away as you could get from how we looked when this whole thing started. This fight rules. We've got high stakes, group strategies, giant monkeys, and tons of awesome set pieces. There are plenty of other incredible beatdowns over the course of the series, but I think this fight has just the right mix of everything that makes this show so goddamn great. Hell yeah. Absolutely. That concludes this year's December. What'd you guys think? Any fights you wish had made the list? What about their placements? Give us your feedback in the comments. Thanks to Granthony for helping write this year's batch, thanks to Stefan for editing all of it, and thanks to me for being the only one to remember we needed an outro before fucking off for Christmas. You filthy animals. But thanks most of all to you guys for celebrating Dragon Ball with us another year. And a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year one and all. And we'll see you next year for another December.